Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to be looking at the first and the last. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the time that we have again this morning to open your word. So we invite your spirit's presence uh, into our study. Um, we just pray, Lord, that you can help each of us as we try to bring our minds into focus on these things. There's much that we have to learn. There's a lot of information that we have to take in. And we need your guidance in understanding it, in sorting through it, and understanding its significance to us today. Uh, we pray for all those who are studying these things, those um, who are watching these videos. We ask that you can bless them and that you can help us in our day-to-day -day lives. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Well, good morning again. And uh, so we were addressing quite a few different points yesterday. We had, we had spent some time looking at the Bay of Pigs, which we're going to come back to at some point. And I, I spent a lot of time going down a rabbit hole with dates and spans of time that I still haven't sorted out. And I don't think I want to torture people with some of that yet. Uh, I'll, I'll wait till later once I have it a bit more sorted out. So what I wanted to look at, so we were addressing uh, the Bishop's Bible in the context of the first and the last. And, and what I have in front of you is Daniel 11, verse 29. And uh, this is just on my eSword, all of the translations that I have. Um, and it just compares them, right? So you can see we got uh, the apostolic uh, Bible there at the top with the Greek. So this is like basically uh, like the Septuagint. Uh, it's a Greek Bible. And, and you can see it says uh, it will not be as the first and as the last. And then you see in the authorized King James or the American King James version, I guess that is. Uh, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Right. And, that, and that's going to be a pretty common translation. It's just saying the time appointed, he shall return, come towards the south. But it's not going to be as it was in the past. The, the older one, the former one, the first one or the last one. It's not going to be like that, right? But you can see here in, um, and I think this is, what translation is this? The ASV, I can't remember. American Standard Version. So the American Standard Version is like the revised version of like 1901. That was a revision that was done using um, some of the corrupted manuscripts that uh, Westcott and Hort uh, brought you know, it's, they looked at critically incorporating the Vaticanus, uh, the Sinaiticus, and um, the Alexandrian manuscripts. And that mostly affects the New Testament because it's, you know, there's there's not much difference in the Old Testament. Uh, so anyway, the American Standard Version says, uh, but it shall not be in the latter time as it was in the former. Same with uh, the BBE that's going to be a translation that is the basic Bible in basic English. And then the Bishop's Bible is the one that we looked at. And, and that one's from 1568, uh, the one here on Esort. At the time appointed, he shall come again and go towards the south. But the last shall not be as the first. And, and you'll see Brenton's Bible, uh, contemporary English version. Um, but this time things will be different. You know, right? I don't really like translations like that because that's a paraphrase. Uh, you can see Darby's just kind of uses the same as the King James, but not as the former time, as the former time shall be. Well, maybe that's, maybe that's saying, I, I don't know, that's really awkward English, but not as the former time shall be the latter. Yeah, so that's like the last shall not be as the first. So you can see, um, and uh, the DRB, uh, that is uh, the, um, the Dewey Reims, so that's the Catholic Bible, which is based on the Latin Vulgate. Uh, you got an English revised version, but this time he will not be successful as he was before. Again, a paraphrase, and there they have uh, ESV Plus. I'm not sure what the ESV Plus is. Uh, maybe. Oh, with notes. Okay. The Geneva Bible, that's, it says, but the last shall not be as the first. So it's going to be very similar to 
uh, the Bishop's Bible. We got the German Bible there. Is that Luther Luther uh, Bible? Yeah. yeah, that's that's uh, this is going to be Luther's the German Luther Bible. That's the LV. And I don't read German very well. Yeah, I just think it says that uh, it shall not be as the former is as the latter. Uh, the Good News Bible. Later on, he will invade Egypt again, but this but this time things will not. This thing, this time things will turn out differently. And I really hate paraphrases. And then you can just see this is some Greek Old Testaments. So anyway, you're going to see the Jewish Publication Society here. It says, but it shall not be in the latter time as it was in the former. So that's like the Bishop's Bible. But you'll see the King James, it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Right? So that's those those differences. So what we had done, uh, so we just go back to the King James. So what we had done is uh, we had noticed this about the Bishop's Bible. And then we had uh, looked at where the first and the last show up in scriptures. And this I found very interesting. Um, and so we found that there is, uh, that most of the time when it's in the Old Testament, when we talk about the first and the last, it's going to talk about uh, the acts of David, of Solomon, Rehoboam, Asa, right, uh, Amaziah, Uzziah, um, and, and some other people. And it's going to talk about the first and the last. So, so the first and the last is talking about people's actions, right, in this context, that are recorded in Scripture, okay? So so this, this brings us to understanding, well, what is this first and last, Right. So these would normally be acts, you know, things that people have done. Now, the interesting thing about uh, uh, first and last is even though the um, the Hebrew words here don't mean alpha and omega. Right. They're based on uh, uh, other other roots. And I'm going to go here. Uh, so I'll show you again. You're going to see this word Rishon is based on the the first word in the Bible, Bereshit or Rosh, just means first. And then this latter, uh, Archeon, uh, just means late or hinder, right? So something that follows after. So that's the last. So the former, that's the first, and the latter is something that follows after. But we do have other places where, when it talks about the first and the last, and especially when we get to Revelation, you know, the last place is Revelation 22, 13. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so so we have two different things. We have where Christ is the first and the last, also the Alpha and Omega. And then we have it in relationship to the acts of kings, mostly what's recorded in God's word. Now, we know Christ, of course, is the living word, right? He's the word of God. He's the logos. So how do we relate uh, these things to this? So one of the ways that we looked at it is because we had the Bishop's Bible and that there is there's three editions of the Bishop's Bible, and then the fourth edition is going to be the 1611 King James. So, so this is quite intriguing, and we just want to get a bit more background on this, and then we'll come back to these scriptures. So we'll go over here. Okay, so here we have uh, just a Wikipedia article on the Bishop's Bible. So the Bishop's Bible is an English edition of the Bible, which was produced under the authority of the established Church of England in 1568. It was substantially revised in 1572, and in 1602, the 1602 edition was prescribed as the base text for the King James Version that was completed in 1611. So what we have here is a 3-1 combination, correct? Do we agree with that? It's a 3-1 combination. Three editions of the Bishop's Bible, and then the fourth ends up being the King James. Now, we know, of course, there's going to be a revision of the King James in 1769, but... We still talk about that's still the King James. 
right? Then there's these other translations, the Geneva Bible, um, the Tyndale uh, Bible, uh, the Great Bible, right? So there's other Bibles. I, I don't know how much, you know, we want to go through the history of these different translations. But you, the Coverdale Bible, the Matthew Bible, the Taverners Bible, Obviously, the Douay Reims Bible, that's going to be uh, translated from the Latin Vulgate. That's going to be the Catholic Bible. Right? The Geneva Bible, you can see these dates here, 1526, 1535, 1537, 39. Taverners and the Great Bible, both are in 1539. Geneva Bible in 1560. Uh, right? Some of these are in different parts here. Different. Uh, these aren't exactly in order here. Chronologically, for some reason, they switched these to, I don't know, that is right. It's chronologically in order. Yeah, we just don't have the Bishop's Bible listed here, right? Because obviously, this is an article on the Bishop's Bible. Any other thing about the Bishop's Bible other than these three editions? Is there anything you want to add, Dwight, about this? I know you look into these things. So we got directed to the Bishop's Bible. Because of how the Bishop's Bible translates, the last shall not be as the first. And that brings us to the first and last. No comments on this at this point? Okay, so since we have this 3-1 combination, when we look at these references, so the first thing is the first reference, the first place in the Bible where we have the first and last. Now, we could look up former and latter, but right now we just looked up first and last. When we do that, we get uh, First Chronicles uh, 2929. Now, remember, we've, we're looking at this in the context of Daniel 11, verse 29. So we have a, a doubling of the number 29 here. Now, it's also going to be First Chronicles, so you've got a one there. So you've got the same digits as in Daniel 11, 29, just only one, one. So it's going to say, you know, now the acts of David, the king first and last. Behold, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, in the book of Nathan, the prophet, in the book of Gad, the seer. So we also notice that there's going to be three different uh, references to where the acts of David are written. Now, in Second Chronicles 2, chapter 9, verse 29. So again, we have the 29. And you could say it's a double of 29 because you could take the two and put it at the beginning. So two, nine, two, nine. But these are going to be the, the rest of the Acts of Solomon, first and last. Now, they're going to be recorded in three places. Uh, Nathan, the prophet, Ahijah, the Shilonite, and the visions of Ido, the seer, against Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. That is, these are three places that we could reference uh this. So again, we have three, right? So we have the first and the last, and then we have three places uh, where we can reference these Acts of Solomon. Then we have a third one. Now this is Second uh, Chronicles 12, verse 15. So we don't have a 29 here. Uh, now the Acts of Rehoboam. So Rehoboam is going to be uh, the king of Judah. Remember, Jeroboam was the king of northern Israel. Rehoboam's uh, the son of Solomon, and and it's going to say the same thing. First and last, they are not. Are they not written in the book of Shem, Shemaiah? Shemaiah, I guess it is the prophet, and of Ido the seer concerning the genealogies. And so this one's only. And the and there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. So here it's only going to mention two references: Shemaiah and Ido the seer. Uh, concerning the genealogies, right? So then it's just going to mention there was wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So again, we, we have this third reference. It's going to be a king of Judah. And then the fourth, though, is Second Chronicles 1611. And, and 1611, that would be the 1611 Bible. And this is going to refer to the Acts of Asa, first and last. Uh, they are written, uh, well, or they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel, right? So now here we have the, the kings of Judah and Israel. That's the only book that's referenced. So do we say that this is significant, that these first three references 
reference the Bishop's Bible, and then the fourth references the King James. Can we accept that idea with Second Chronicles 16.11 there? Does that seem reasonable, unreasonable? I heard the question. I don't quite understand it. Repeat it. Okay. So we have, we have the, the three Bishop's Bibles followed by the King James in 1611. When we look up first and last, we have uh, the Acts of David, Solomon, and Rehoboam. Those would represent the Bishop's Bible. And then the fourth reference, Second Chronicles 1611, would reference the, the King James because of the 1611 and because of the structure here. So we're saying that this represents the word of God, that this first and last, because that's what we're looking into. And we're trying to understand it in the context of Daniel chapter 11, verse 29. And we have these references to 29. Now we have in second Chronicles 12, 15. I don't know the significance of that verse number, but all the, the other ones we can see the 29s. And, and obviously 1611 refers to the 1611 King James. So is that a reasonable that, that this is not just some coincidence that we looked up first and last, you know, we looked at the Bishop's Bible and then we looked at every place first and last is. And, and the first four places cover the Bishop's Bible to the King James so that there's some reference here to the word of God in this 11 uh, verse 29 in Daniel. I don't see that there's any coincidences. And yeah, this this does make sense. Yeah. Well, there are such things as coincidences. I mean, that that aren't significant, but this type of coincidence would be significant. Right. We we would we it would be really hard to dismiss it as just a mere coincidence. So we're going to accept it. Now what what it means exactly, we still haven't decided. Now, we then uh, look up these other firsts and lasts. So uh, we're going to have 2 Chronicles uh, 30 verse 30 or 20 verse 34. Now, the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat, first and last, they're going to be written in the book of Jehu, the son of Hanani, right? Who is mentioned in the book of the kings of Israel. Uh, You're going to have 2 Chronicles 25, 26. These are going to be the acts of Amaziah first and last. So you're going to see that they're always going to be referencing that they're written somewhere, right? So these are acts, and and these are acts of kings, right? First and last. Now in uh, so we got Uzziah there in Second Chronicles twenty eight twenty six. Uh, you're going to have Ahaz. Doesn't mention it in the verse, but in the context, you can see it's going to be Ahaz. In Second Chronicles 35, uh, 27, it's going to be Josiah. His deeds, first and last, behold, they are written in the book of, of the kings of Israel and Judah. And then Nehemiah 8, 18. Now, this is, is interesting because it's also day by day from the first day unto the last day. Right. And again, it's still the same Hebrew words. He read in the book of the law. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to the manner. So in this one, we have this significance of it's actually a reading of the book of the law. Right now, it's not talking about acts from the first to the last. It's talking about from the first day to the last day. So also day by day during this time of the feast, they keep this feast seven days. uh, And then on the eighth day is a solemn assembly. I'm I'm not sure. Probably on the eighth day, they also read it. I'm not certain. I'd have to read more of the context. That's Nehemiah 8.18, right? Now then, the other ones, we're going to have uh, Isaiah 41.4, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. So... I believe that this is saying that God has been working with from the first generation to the last generation. He's the one who has done this, right? All these wonderful things and that he's going to be with them 
So he's been with them from the beginning to the end. This one, which I know well, uh, I wrote it as a scripture song. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So this first and last is a reference to Christ. Now, now this one here in Jeremiah 50, verse 17, uh, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria hath devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. Now, what would be the significance of this verse? Is this more showing how that when we get away from Miller's rules, that the lions are scattering us and that then Nebuchadnezzar or pagan you know, papalism breaks the the very support of everything that's been studied okay well i never thought of it that way i mean maybe you know if you're looking at sort of a kind of the lesson from it i was just thinking more about the fact that leviticus 20 26 according to ellen white you know dealing with leviticus 26 and deuteronomy 28 that uh, this scattering here and this uh this is Assyria and Babylon, and Leviticus 26 is fulfilled in part in the period of Judges, but in more complete fulfillment by the captivity of northern Israel and Assyria and by Judah in Babylon. So I'm just saying that it's a reference to the 2520, uh, the beginning of the prophetic mirror. That's that's more what I was thinking, but um, I guess the other would apply as well. So here, though, we have this first and last, and, and this, this is a principle of prophecy, that again, there is a beginning and an end. There's things that happen earlier, things that happen later. And, and can we say that these are typical of each other, that there is, there is typology in what happens to northern Israel in that it's going to happen to Judah as well? And we saw that when you take the line of Samaria and stretch it over the line of Jerusalem, right? In uh, Second Kings, I always forget which chapter, 24. That's going to be, yeah, right. Dealing with Manasseh, right? That one where he says, I will stretch over Jerusalem the line of Samaria and the plummet of Ahab. And I will wipe Jerusalem as a man wipe at the dish wiping and turning it upside down. So we can see that, that something that happens first can be typical of something that happens later. And this is an important principle, right? When it comes to, uh, what was happening in the movement in 2018, uh, Parminder was arguing that we can't have a waymark typify another waymark, which was totally absurd. Uh, but Jeff bought into it. You know, he accepted what Parminder was saying. I'm, I'm not sure why, because it get, went against everything that Jeff had been teaching. But somehow Parminder had convinced him. Uh, so anyway, th- this is important in the context of understanding prophecy. That's kind of the main point there. Now, this one here in Matthew 12, verse 45, where it talks about uh, a person having a demon cast out of him. Right, an unclean spirit, you know, so he gets all cleaned up, but th- he returns and finds the house, you know, n- empty, swept and garnished. So he taketh himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they dwell in that man. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now here, of course, it's not the same Hebrew words because it's Greek. But here we're going to see uh, and, and the words here, you know, uh, we got uh Ekatos, ekatos means uh, the end, you know, like es- eschatology. Eschatos would be the root of the word eschatology, the study of end, t- end things, right? So that's the last thing. And then protos uh, is g- going to be the word for first. So that's the first, right? Before beginning, right? So those are just the Greek equivalents to the Hebrew words latter and former, first and last last and first so we have that verse 
Now, the other thing that we have, many are first shall be last, and last shall be first. Now, of course, this is in the context of those that are seeking their own, you know, they're seeking to be first, well, they're going to be last. And the ones that are last, the ones that are not considered important, they shall be first. So that principle is well understood in Matthew 20, verse 8. And if you have any comments on these, I'm kind of moving through them quickly here. Uh, so when even was come and the Lord of the vineyard said unto the steward, call the laborers and give them their hire beginning from the last unto the first. So we know this is when they get paid. They agreed all to the same wage or the, the people at the beginning, the first ones that agreed to a wage. But everybody's going to get the same wage and they complain, right? The 11th hour workers get paid a penny just like everyone else. Um, but they're going to begin at the last unto the first. So the first to thinking, well, they must be getting more because they worked all day. Again, Matthew 20, verse 16 is just going to reiterate that idea. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Matthew 27, 64, uh, talking about the sealing of uh, the tomb, could Christ being risen on the third day. Um, and then they use this expression uh, so that the last error shall be worse than the first. So this is just a comparative of these two, right? So they have this other error. If, you know, Jesus is res resurrected or they think he is, then that last error shall be worse than the first error, right? And then Mark 9.35, talking about who is the greatest. If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Right. So in order to be first, you have to be a servant. Uh, Mark 10, 31, but many that are first shall be last and last first. Um, so you got the same one the state of a man is worse. The last state of a man is worse than the first with the seven spirits entering into him. Uh, Luke 13, 30, behold, they are last, which shall be first. There are first, which shall be last. So that same idea is iterated. Um, and then you got. First Corinthians 15, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living spirit. And the last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. Right. So here, of course, this first and last, we know the first and last Adam. And, and that has to do with typology. So, again, it's a prophetic principle. Second Peter 3, 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. These ones are not related. It's just... Obviously, doesn't doesn't really apply as a comparison of first and last. It's going to use, uh, I think, the same words, though. But it's just that one's proton and eschatos. Yeah, same words. But, you know, not um, not significant. Now, Revelation 1 verse 11. So we have this symbol of January 11th. So that's a, a, a prophetic symbol. Right. We have other places where we've used that and Christ saying, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. So here we can see this connection between Alpha and Omega. Right. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia. So you can have these seven churches having uh, the word of God sent to them, a message sent to them, uh, the first and the last. In verse 17, he says he's the first and the last. And to Smyrna, he re references that, that I'm the first and the last. That's going to be, uh, I can't remember which one this was, Thyatira. He's going to mention the first and the last. And the last place that first and the last are mentioned is also going to have the Alpha and Omega. So in, in Revelation, Christ is referred to as the Alpha Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. At the beginning of Revelation, in the first chapter and in the last chapter. So we can see the connections between first and last with God's word, with the acts, with, with actions. So when we go to Daniel, back to Daniel chapter 11, verse 29, and we start addressing this first and last, uh, but it shall not be as the former or as, as the latter. We were just, we, we took this as an event. And, and the former event we looked at, at different ways to interpret what events are being referred to. But we also can take the idea uh, that the last shall not be as the first. That is, if we took it as that, we could understand it that 
the omega will not be as the alpha. But in, in this context here, we, we would have to understand, well, there's a lot of, a lot of questions. Um, so, so we have the word of God as, as being symbolized. Could it refer to the teachings um, of Parminder and Tess that they're contrary to what was given at the beginning, that there's a rejection of the foundation? Are we, we going off track a little bit here? Um, I, I like that position you just presented about that right. Parminder and Tess and how they are taking this off track. Right. And, and if we look at this as a battle between the king of the north and the king of the south, Right. So I know this is hard to get our, our minds around because we have all these different ways we're looking at this one verse. But if we look at this this last one I have here where I put why do I have image in there? Oh, I know why. That should be there. OK. Started typing when I was typing uh, a search. I typed it in there. OK. At the time appointed. Right. So we're going to say November 9th, 1989. That's the historic application of this verse. It's referring to referring to Daniel 11, verse 40 B. He, the papacy in the United States, uh, which is the king of the north, shall return and come toward the south. Uh, but the last 1989 shall not be as the first. And 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 the first there is going to be 1798 in that the north and south are reversed. Now, if we apply this then to. uh our history, November 9th, 2019, is the present truth application. And the papacy and the king of the north are represented by FFA. You know, so he shall return and come toward the south. The USSR, they're typifying Parminder and Tess. Now, they're switched around, right? It is you got the, the combining of two. That represents one FFA and the one that represents the combining of two. So it's, it's reversed and that's allowed. But it says, but the last that is the omega. So we're saying instead of, instead of these events that being referred to, uh, that basically the USSR, which typifies Parminder and Tess, typifies the omega. So that's one way of looking at it. And then. Uh, they shall not be as the first, that is, the alpha. So that is 1798, right? So so the question is, how do we take 1798, these years, in 1989, and equate them uh, in that way? So so I, I think that becomes a little bit difficult to sort of just say the last is Parminder's movement, the first is is FFA. But maybe there's a way that we could understand that. So we have this Alpha and Omega. Then all it would be saying is that in November 9th, 2019, that uh, this Omega group is not going to have the same teachings as the Alpha group, right? That's what it would be saying. It's not based upon the same uh, message, right? So, so the last and the first are not going to be referring to events, but just to the teachings of the Alpha and the Omega. So any comments on that interpretation? So that could be true. And and this also, whoops, I don't want that one. I think I have to do it. Pardon me. I got to undo that. Put it in the wrong spot. spot. I have to put it here because I have the one above. So the one above is the same idea. But here we're not using alpha and omega as in the groups. We're using the events, right? So, so it's simply the same at the beginning, but when it says the former shall not be as, or the, the latter shall not be as the former, the latter is going to be November 9th, 2019, and the former is going to be November 19th, 1989. And just the difference is here that it, it's not going to be internal, uh, or it's going to be internal and not external when it comes to November 9th, 2019. But we could see then how both of these would apply if that we could we could take that the last shall not be as the first as referring to the omega and the alpha in the context of that battle of November 9th, 2019. Now here it says 
that um, but the latter shall not be as the former. Now we're saying that. So one of the things, just let's see if I can say this clearly. So we know that on November 9th, 2019, we have this battle between the King of the North and the King of the South. And the movement looked at this as being about the United States and Russia. But in reality, it wasn't external. It was a battle internal between these two different forces, right? Between the Alpha and the Omega. And that the Alpha represents the King of the North and the Omega, the King of the South internally within this movement. Now, the King of the North represents uh, republicanism and the King of the South represents uh, liberalism. Okay, we'll, we'll say it that way. Does this make sense, taking these verses, this verse and interpreting these two, two different ways? Any comments on it? So to add to it, we have here that the first and the last brought us to the scriptures. Right. It brought us to the bishop's Bible and it clearly shows that this is about God's word. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. This is Christ. And that there's this battle over God's word that's actually occurring really historically and, and also in the present truth aspect. Can we see that that's what happened in the movement, that this is a battle over the word of God? How to understand God's word. People agree. That's how we should understand this. Based on all the things that we looked at. I, you know, I would say that this is having to look quite logical. That this, this would be better applied to something internal rather than an external. In the present truth application, yes. Yes, very yeah. much. So in the present truth application, we can see that what, because well, the historical is November 9th, 1989. But if we're going to make the present truth application, it has to be this battle over God's word. And that, that we can interpret this first and the last in a number of ways, because it's used in scripture in a few ways. But, but ultimately, they still focus and come together as relating to God's word in regard to prophecy. God declares the end from the beginning. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. And we can see... That in this battle between God's word, we have these two groups. One we call the Alpha and the Omega. And an Alpha and Omega uh, can refer to God's word and also to, to errors. Ellen White uses it in regard to the Alpha of apostasy. The Omega right. is going to be worse, right? So, so we're familiar with that idea. It's just basically the first and the last. The beginning of something and the end of something. And we can see that a person who has, has received the truth... Right. He's he's been healed of a spirit that had entered into him, but he doesn't have God's spirit filling him. This this demon's going to come back and find you know, the place clean and garnished and, you know, lots of food in the fridge. And he's going to invite, you know, seven buddies that are worse. Right. More wicked than himself. And the state of that man will be worse than his first state. And we can see that with the Omega. We can see that with individuals. We can see that within the movement. And, and I think that that's what has happened uh, to a large degree, not to be you know, critical of individuals or anything. But when it comes to understanding God's word, we had a foundation that was laid that was correct. It led to a prediction. That prediction didn't come about the way that we expected. But that prediction was of God. Those that abandon that go into darkness. Right? Great. The last state of that man is worse than the first. Because if we are not converted, if the Holy Spirit does not enter into us and fill us, you know, Christ stands at the door and knocks. And, you know, if any man can open that door, I will come in with him and sup with him. Right? Um. And Ellen White says we need to remove the rubbish from the door of the heart and allow Christ to come in. But he has to fill us. You know, if we if he comes in and, and sets the house in order but then leaves, we're in danger. And I think that's what, what has happened to many people. And and it and it's 
I don't like to use the word like scary. I'm not like trying to scare people or anything. But the reality is that we have to take this very seriously. You know, it's not a matter of some intellectual game arguing over uh, these things. You know, this is not something we're doing for fun. It's not it, it's not a game um, when we're discussing these things. And, and we definitely can't bring our personal feelings and, you know, hurt feelings and pride and, and all of those human elements into this type of discussion, right? Everything that we have tried to do in studying Daniel chapter 11 and all the studying that we've done is to understand what God's word is saying to us so that we can be converted. That That's the purpose. And and this, to me, is amazing, you know, what we found yesterday, just how we stumbled upon it, let's say, by just looking at the first and the last, looking at Bishop's Bible, seeing that this is a reference to God's word, and that this is what the battle is about presently in this movement, is about God's word, how to understand God's word. And we have, you know, the vast majority of the movement rejecting the light that God gave us on how to understand his word. We've abandoned the, you know, the methodology, the line upon line, um, having Millerite history as the pattern in which to test and study everything. And, and we've entered into this very speculative uh, way of, of studying. I'm just going to put this in here. So does that make sense? I, I think it, I think it has to. It is kind of bizarre that we have that connection to the bishop's Bible by looking at first and last. You know that three one combination is a very powerful symbol. And Second Chronicles sixteen eleven. I mean, that that to me is pretty remarkable. Any other thoughts on this study on first and last? I think you've made kind of a prima facie case for why this is uh, something worthy of consideration. And, and, and we can see then that uh, verse 29 is parenthetical, right? Correct. It, it's, not, it's not part of the line itself. It's just, it's just telling us that there's going to be this repeat of history. Right. It's saying Daniel 11 verse 40a is going to have a Daniel 11 verse 40b. And that's going to be November 9th, 1989. But we can also still make a present truth application that shows that what happened in that battle between the king of the north and the king of the south in 1989 was typifying what happened 30 years later within this movement. And that's so consistent with everything that we have discovered. And, and that also undoes everything that people in the movement are trying to do in regard to predicting events in connection with the Sunday law by reading the headlines on the news. That really is everyone who is not following July 18, 2020 as, um, as a date that was led by God has become part of the Omega. Can we say that? Just in a, in, I'm never ever talking about individuals what their destiny is. I'm just talking in the general sense that basically the teachings of Parminder and Tess have taken over the movement. Even though they may consider themselves conservative, that wasn't the main element that needed to be, that really distinguished, um, you know, the political view is not really what distinguishes how we just study God's word, Right. We, we divide it up more politically than spiritually. Sad but true. Yeah. And so, so people believe that they were on the right side when they were of the same spirit, of the same uh, teaching as Parminder and Tess. And, and there is such a difference. And, and it's not evident to them that there is this difference. They don't understand what it is that that led us to July 18, 2020, and they don't understand why they were disappointed. They, and, and it really has to do with the purpose of God's word, right? God's word is meant to purify us, not to justify human nature. So if we look at 
November 9th, 2019. We look at this battle that goes on. We know that FFA was on the right side of that battle, the alpha, but the foundation that was laid, because we examined the foundation, it was laid correctly. And then we studied the lines, and the lines are correct, but that has been rejected by the movement. And really the principle of alpha and omega, that Jeff, one, one interview that he did, it, it would have been quite early on. I, I'm not sure the year that it was done, it was in the around 2010, somewhere around there. He did an interview that was online for a long time. I don't know if it's still there. And and the interviewer asked him, you know, what's the most important Bible principle? And and Jeff said, well, you know, it's it's the Alpha and Omega. God declares the end from the beginning, the first and the last. Right. Now, I asked Jeff about it, you know, some years later. And he said, well, you know, I don't remember why I said that, you know, because there's lots of really important ones. But I do think it is an important principle. It is a foundational principle that Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first and the last. And and to understand that principle is to understand typology. And, And the way that we have been studying this is this very way. All of these things are typical. All these things that happen for aforetime happen for our learning, right? These are in samples, types. Typos. So this is this is where we are at. This is that's why we need to understand what happened on November 9th, 2019, what that meant in the scheme of things. Right. So November 9th, 2019 is a time appointed as well, just as November 9th, 1989. So, well, it's part of the Sunday. And so we have this miniature line, this internal line that was meant to correct this movement so that we could complete the task. And and we have to believe that God's will has been done. So, you know, to go back and and to start, you know, like reading Jeff's new material, and I'm not saying that, you know, you shouldn't read it, it's evil or anything like that. I'm not like uh, saying anything like that, because I don't think there's anything wrong with looking at it and reading it, and I look at it. But if you're looking at it as the source of truth, and you're accepting things like, July 18, 2020 was an error and that there was a sin in warning Nashville, you would be walking on very dangerous ground. Definitely, we need to to look at other things and we need to compare scripture with scripture. But we need to understand the principles behind this. Okay, so there's my little bit of my appeal. So we covered that topic sufficiently. The first and the last, the Bishop's Bible. Daniel 11, verse 29. I think that many items have been presented for consideration, and this has, I I don't think it's exhaustive, but it's been well presented. Yeah, it's definitely not exhaustive. I mean, uh, but yeah, so so it's something that we need to keep considering because we might come back to it at some point. But I think as far as as presenting that part, it's pretty clear. Now, we do have some loose ends dealing with the Bay of Pigs. Has there been any thought about that line that we started with yesterday? You know, I I mean, I still am trying to figure it out. Why all of a sudden we were directed to that from Daniel 11, verse 29, while I was studying that. I don't know if it relates directly to Daniel 11, verse 29. But it might relate more to what what we see here, uh, the fall of Western Rome. Okay, well, let's think about it a little bit. So we know the United States was raised up to, uh, uh, you know, it has horns like a lamb. It's got the separation of church and state, correct? Agreed. You got, you know, one horn is the Protestant horn and the other is the Republican horn, and they're they're separate. Now, we know that the Protestant horn is going to fall in Millerite history. And the Republican horn is falling in our history. And that's something that we really need to to, to get a grasp on. That is, that 1798 to 1844, the, the Protestant horn falls. And from 1989 to the Sunday Law, the Republican horn falls, right? And, and Protestantism has continued to fall. Their, their, their fall was not complete in Millerite history. They just become a part of Babylon. It has to do with how they study God's word and the rejection of prophecy. 
And so we see that happening in a progressive way uh, since Millerite history. So that you have a Protestantism now that is, is basically unrecognizable as Protestantism, right? Uh, it's definitely evil. The Christian churches are not Christian. So if we think about that and we think this parallel about Rome, so remember that, that there is this understanding that the fall of Rome is a parallel to the fall of the United States. Correct? Agreed. Okay. So that the ships of Kittim here in the present truth application, because we worked out the historical application. We have no problem with that. I think it's pretty solid. Uh, but within the present truth application, that this has to address the fall of the USSA. The USSA. <laughs> Uh, slip of the tongue there. You know, it's not the USSR, it's the USA. Okay, the USA. Sometimes it feels like the USSA. United Socialist States of America? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, one, of the, one of the other points um, with this verse, 1130. Yeah. This one is marked out in the 1769 Bible with the the paragraph symbol showing that this is a different thought. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's not connected to, uh, well, directly to verse 29. And actually I just think verse 29 is parenthetical. So I do think that uh, when you look at uh, when he shall return into his, his land with great riches in verse 28, 28 and his heart shall be against the Holy covenant. And he shall do and return into his own land. And then I have in which. I think the in which is actually referring back to 28, not to verse 29. Okay. That's the way that I would do it. So when I'm, so that he returns to his own land and it's in his own land that the ships of Kittim shall come against him. After he has per persecuted God's people, Rome has persecuted God's people, then we're going to have the fall of Rome, right? And this happens progressively. Right, this the, the Germanic tribal invasions. So obviously in Revelation, we're going to see that it's the first four trumpets that are going to deal with the fall of Western Rome, and then we're going to have the fall of Eastern Rome with the uh, the fifth and sixth trumpet, and then the fall of modern Rome with the seventh trumpet. Just simplification there. So these Germanic tribal invasions, if we're going to deal with the ships of Kittim, this is something then in the present truth application. That has to do with the fall of the United States. And the question is, who, what does this dramatic tribal invasions symbolize? What is what are the forces that cause the fall of the U.S.? And, and when does that begin? Now, remember, we say the USA, but this is also apostate Protestantism. Now, it is true that apostate Protestantism uh, doesn't just exist in the U.S. or didn't just exist in the U.S. It existed within Europe as well, right? It's just that the United States is the place where uh, the woman flees for 1260 years. So now we would have to look at this and, and try to say, okay, the Germanic tribal invasions. I mean, are we going to put this to, you know, to World War II? Is this the beginning of the fall of the United States? Are we going to put it to World War I? Are we going to place it earlier? Is this going to be Islam? Is this going to be the ideologies of Nazism? Is it going to be uh, socialism, you know, communism? Is it something else? And how are we going to put this on the line? Where are we going to start this? Any ideas about this at this point? Any thoughts of what we could do with the ships of Kittim? Well, from what the translators had looked at, they're applying a verse with a doubling as part of their the reference for this passage so they're using numbers 24 24 uh for where ships of kittim oh i see what you're saying so you're saying uh with the ships of kittim if we look up so you're looking in the dictionary for kittim no i'm i'm looking what are you numbers doing? 24 24 reads Oh, and numbers 24, 24. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, the ships shall come from the coast of Kittim 
and shall afflict Asher, which is Assyria, right. and shall afflict Eber, and, um, and he shall perish forever. He also shall perish forever. So they're going to afflict Asher and Eber. Now, Asher, now who's Eber? Because Asher we know, that's Assyria. He's a son of Sam, Shem, the second son of Shem. And so that's the region of that empire. And then Eber, so in that context, uh, Shem's, it's one of the sons of, of uh, Shem. Eber, Eber, the region beyond. Son of Salad, great grandson of Shem, Shem, father of Peleg and Joktan. So he's a grandson of Shem. Means on the opposite side, usually the east. So it's going to afflict, uh, afflict the ships of Kittim, come and afflict Asher, Assyria, and also uh, the east. So Asher, Assyria is usually the king of the north. Eber, in the east. Any thoughts on this? What we could do with this? Here's the son of Salah, the great son, grandson of Shem. We also had another Heber that was Jael's uh, husband. That's not, that's where I'd seen it before. But, um, it's interesting because this being part of Balaam's first oracle against Israel, mm-hmm. isn't it part of the blessings that Balaam was uh, bidden to give? Yeah. So here again, do we tie this with the first and the last? Well, yeah, in the sense of typology, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So obviously the ships of Kittim there, uh, they're going to be affecting uh, how we see them. Typically, obviously we know they're not literally the ships of Kittim, you know, in the present truth application. But even here, even even in the historical application, they are being used as a symbol, right? Because, I mean, these are dramatic tribal invasions, but they use, you know, the idea of the ships of Kittim to symbolize that. So so in the fall of Western Rome, one of the things we see is that as Rome is falling, it's going to have indignation against the Holy Covenant, right? And so there's going to be a persecution of God's people. So, I mean, we can, you know, in starting to look at this and putting in the present truth application, um, we still haven't decided who the Germanic tribal invasions are symbolizing, but we can definitely see that Western Rome represents the West. We'll put it that way. Maybe we'll call it just the West. So it's not just the United States, but it is, uh, you know, primarily, you know, the USA, right? Because the United States is, in a sense, what we have right now, this, this globalist economy, is the result of the United States protectionism, right? People agree. Okay. Without the United States being the the police of the world, we wouldn't have a global economy. And and the concern that many people are having with the attacks on the U.S. Um, ideologically, but also upon internally, upon its its economic status, is that if the United States pulls out of a global economy or its, its position is weakened, the global economy collapses. And if it doesn't collapse, well, or in its collapse, the concern of secular people is that China is going to step in and become uh, the one in control of the global economy. And, you know, I don't, I'm not so concerned about that. But, um, you know, that's the concern that secularists have with what's happening. But you, you can see that... Uh, you know, and I don't know if China could actually do that, but uh, I don't think they have the power to. It's they might have aspirations to, but it's just going to lead to the fall of the U.S. What China is doing and what everyone else is doing, and that puts the world in turmoil. So I think more likely what would happen is the United States, uh, with with everything falling apart, the United States would be asked to step in uh, again just because the results will be so dire, you know, with the United States collapse. And we, we see similar things happening with the fall of the Roman Empire. It's a long, complicated story of how uh, Rome falls. So anyway, I just think that this is uh, the West. So 
what are the Germanic tribal invasions that are destroying the West? Well, these would have to be more ideologies. I mean, we're not looking at military power coming in against the United States. Right. I don't know how we would characterize this. I mean, there's lots of different uh, adjectives we could use, lots of different uh, words. And, and, you know, you got communism, you got uh, communistic, right? Uh, you got wokeism. Uh, but really, where does this start, this ships of kitten? Right. Because normally we think of this as economic, right? The ships. It's part right. of an economic, not a military. So I don't know if we put this as economic or I don't know what happened to this verse. It got moved around somehow. I have no idea what put me here. I just got to go back and get this. Somehow I got that messed up. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, so we have the ships of Kitten. How, how are we going to characterize this? Anybody have a suggestion? Well, right now we're we're considering this in a in a very different manner. I mean, again, we had looked at this as being where Kitten was the economic engine, but now we're we're going to look at this more internally than we had been externally, right? Well, I, I don't know if this is going to be internal, like within the movement. This is going to just be the present truth application. So what we would be looking at is creating another line with this uh, addressing our history. So 1989 to the Sunday law. So we're looking at the, so one thing is we have agreed that, that there are, that, that it is true that we can say that the former and the latter can represent uh, the fall of Egypt and the fall of Rome. Right now, here we have the fall of Rome. It's being typical of the fall of the United States. Okay, so and, and so when other times we looked at 1989, you know, we look at 1989 as the fall of the Soviet Union. But in 1989, even though you know the Soviet Union is going to fall, it is connected with the fall of the United States because republicanism, republicanism is the horn that's going to fall in our history. And I would think that this is actually addressing that horn. So, so we should be able to take this. So just in a general sense, the ships of Kittim represent some kind of ideology that's going to come against the West, you know, and it, it's typified by the Germanic tribal invasions. So is it, a, a, is it uh, modernism? Is it postmodernism? Is it post postmodernism? Is it, uh, Humanism, you know, what's the broadest sort of term that we can use to describe what's going to lead to the fall of the United States? And and we know that that's going to be connected with the United States uh, persecuting God's people, but also connecting itself with the papacy, right? That's going to be, uh, they have shall have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. We would have to say, uh, that the United States does have intelligence with them that have uh, forsake the Holy Covenant, that is apostate Christianity. So I'm just not sure how how we're going to put this into the present truth application. But to me, verse 30 is representing the events prior to 1989, that there is a fall that happens in the United States that leads to 1989. Does that make sense? I think it may have some merit. Okay. And then and then we're going to have, you know, like uh, the continuation of the 1,200 years of the daily, the indignation. Well, obviously, historically, that's going to be pagan Rome, right? Paganism, all of these pagan powers. Uh, they're going to have indignation against the Holy Covenant. I mean, part of what we see is there's an ideology that is attacking the foundation of Christianity uh, through this history. So paganism tries to destroy, destroy Christianity. Well, we see that that's happening ideologically within the West, right? So there's this foundation that's laid so that the United States can join with, like here, you know, we got pagan Rome and, and we have to decide, you know, what, what is pagan Rome symbolizing? Is it just directly symbolizing the papacy or is it symbolizing, you know, 
the United States. So, you know, we'd say, well, it's the papacy. But if you have it as the papacy, he shall do. And then it says, he, the papacy, shall return and have intelligence within the forsake the Holy Covenant. Well, that wouldn't make sense, right? If we say pagan Rome, then it's typifying the U.S., which is what I was saying before. Apostate Christianity, uh, that would be uh, the papal power. So, you know, we have an option. We could say, well, it's it's intelligence within the forsake the Holy Covenant. That would be Protestants. You know, so you could say it's Protestants. But this is the United States itself having intelligence with them that have forsaken the Holy Covenant. And to me, the best example would be the papacy, right? And then when it says arms shall stand on his part, well, we would have to say that, that the arms, that's going to be the United States military. And his part, that's going to be the papacy. As here it says on behalf of papal Rome, well, again, this here... You know, and that's where we have to decide how we're going to do this because historically it's papal Rome. Now we're saying that, uh, the United, pagan Rome represents the U.S., papal Rome represents the papacy. Make sense? Again, it's worthy of consideration. So, I mean, that's kind of where we're pointing. At least that's how I've looked at it, but we're going to have to consider this, you know, in more detail tomorrow, but we need, we, we do need a present truth application of these verses. Then we have to see. And 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 I would say, well, arm standing on his part, that's going to be, you know, referring to uh, that history from November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, 1991. You know, Clovis's baptism, December 25th, 508. Let's see how that connects. Now we're going to have, you know, the Sunday law, obviously, that happens in that history is going to be typical of the Sunday law that happens in our history. Right. The papacy is going to be set upon the throne of this, the earth. You know, so there's lots, lots of lots here that we're going to have to sort through. It's going to take a little while. But you, you can see the general idea of what I'm thinking, whether that's the correct way to interpret it or not. But the idea is that gap chapter uh, 11, verse 29 addresses what happens in the movement internally. But when we get to verse 30, we're going back to the broader line that we have. It's still going to address what's going to happen in the movement as we, we go further along. And, and I would think that this is going to end up, you know, at the end of verse 35. Um, you know, definitely we're going to be in this history of the Sunday law and the persecution and the loud cry, just exactly where this line ends. I'm not sure. When we get to verse 36, the idea is that verse 36 is just describing the man of sin, right? as he is in the 1260 years of papal supremacy. But we would have to have a present truth application to what happens with the Antichrist at the end of the world, right? So I'm not sure how that's going to work out. That's all I'm saying. I don't, I don't know if it's... I, I definitely haven't considered all, all the details here. Okay? Well... Uh, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love and for the study here this morning. We invite your Holy Spirit to be with us throughout this day as we continue to consider these things. We ask for your angels' care and protection for our family and loved ones. We pray for one another. Help us in the trials that we face. And continue to lead in these studies, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.